some peace from the hot sun. <laughs> yeah, it's not Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for, for having me. It's a big kavod. Uh, it's a, um, a big schut to be here. Uh, we uh, try to go anywhere and everywhere that uh, Hashem sends us to uh, help people see, uh, see light, see the, uh, you know, the clear truth for what it is. And the reason why is because this generation, like every generation before it, has a big Yetzara. But the Gemara says that the Yetzara has seven names. In reality, Yetzara has a lot more than names than seven. There's other places you see that he has more names than seven. So what is the Gemara trying to teach us? It's trying to teach us that the Yetzara is going to come to you in every single direction. Right, left, up, down. Sometimes your religious cousin that goes off to Derech all of a sudden wants you to go off to Derech. Sometimes the... Uh, you know, the news that's supposed to be good news and kosher news becomes bad news. Sometimes the uh, book that you thought was a good book ends up being uh, by not such a good author. You know, the Yetzirah comes in different ways to confuse us and to make us think that maybe we, the ones that are trying to keep Torah and mitzvot, should be jealous of the ones that are not keeping Torah and mitzvot. So, the Mesilat Yesharim says that if you ever want to learn Torah, you want to learn Torah also from a Baal Tshuva. Why you want to learn Torah from a Baal Tshuva? I mean, technically, if somebody was religious their whole life, they learned Torah their whole life, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Why, why shouldn't you just focus on that? Why should you learn Torah from somebody that uh, used to be a Rasha? Used to be uh, not such a good person, according to Hashem's definition. According to regular people's definition, could be a wonderful person. But according to Hashem's definition, wasn't exactly an uh, angel. Because the Mesilat Yesharim says, if a person already did tshuva, that means that he can tell you about the Yetzara that the religious guy from birth is not going to be able to tell you because he never met him. He never met the Yetzara of Wall Street because he never, was never there. So, Baruch Hashem, over the last six or so years that uh, we've been doing shiurim and giving shiurim all over the world, I live in Florida for the last five years. Uh, there's nothing to be jealous about. It's always hot. And uh, there's an uh, enormous amount of Yetzara over there for people. So my two destinations are either the Beknesset or my house. If you want to stay kosher, that's the only way to be over there. Uh, because as soon as you go outside, Hashem Yerachem. It's a, every Yetzara known to man shows up. And I tell people, I feel bad. People that have to be outside, work outside. You know, because sometimes people leave the house and they forget their clothes at home. I told people, listen, if you ever want to get into a good business in New York, in, uh, in Florida, and every, there's a very good business opportunity. Clothes. Sell people clothes and encourage them to wear it. Today people forget to wear their clothes. 
But anyway, Rabotai, it's a... Uh, so over the last six years, we've been giving shiurim in Florida, in California, in New York, in Arizona, in Eretz Israel, everywhere and anywhere that someone is willing to listen to Divrei Torah. But most people that get to know us usually get to know us by the personal story. And uh, personal story is what we'll try to go over a little bit today to give you a little bit of an uh, encouragement, but also give you a little bit of insight of why there's absolutely nothing to even think that's better on the other side. Because at your age, I remember a long time ago that uh, if somebody wanted to start doing tshuva or somebody wanted to keep mitzvot, somebody wanted to go and start learning Torah at 16, 17, 18 years old, you always ask them, why? Like, why would you do it? Why wouldn't you want to go and do this, this, and that? Because the reality is that people that are not religious don't know the schut, the privilege of learning Torah each day and being an Eved Hashem. Now, my life wasn't like this most of my life. I was born in Israel. I came to the United States when I was 10 years old. In Israel, we went to what's called the Masorti school. Masorti means that we keep some mitzvot, we don't keep some mitzvot. That's really what it means. Every, every uh, semester, they use a masor. Masor in Hebrew, it means the saw. Every semester, they cut a few more mitzvot from the Torah. Whatever they like, they keep. Whatever they don't like, they throw away. That's what happens, unfortunately. So we went to a Masorti school. In school, you keep, wear a kippah. At home, you don't wear a kippah. So we came here, we thought that, you know, here it's called traditional. So we came here, we said we figured we're traditional, you know, we'll do Kiddush, but as soon as we finish Kiddush, watch TV. You know, we go to Beknesset on Yom Kippur, but as soon as the fast is over, we're back to regular life as if nothing happened. Like we did Shuvah for one day, the rest of the year, we're not even thinking about Shuvah. So we came to the U.S. almost 30 years ago, I was 10 years old. Since I didn't speak English, they thought I was retarded, so they put me in special ed. <laughs> no, really, Bimet, they really did. Uh, they put me in special ed, and, uh, you know, one kid in my class in sixth grade had a beard. I thought he was at least 30 years old. <laughs> and uh, by, by, the, uh, by seventh grade, one of my teachers, uh, my math teacher, told me, did you really do that bad in all your other classes that you're here with the rest of these uh, kids? I said, no, uh, no, actually, I'm getting an A student everywhere else. He says, so why are you here? He says, because the system thinks that if you don't speak English, that means that you're mentally deficient. He said, well, you speak English fine. I said, yeah, but when I first came to the country two years ago, I only knew you know, ABC because it was on a cereal box. <laughs> so, Baruch Hashem, I uh, worked up the ladder. By eighth grade, I was already taking advanced placement classes in uh, high school. I was a very good student. I was taking a college courses already. I was an athlete also. I played football, but as far as Avodat Hashem, as far as, you know, being a Jew, that was only a few times a year. Whenever, whenever there was a holiday, we'll keep it, at least to the best of our ability. We'll eat matzah on Pesach, we'll fast on Yom Kippur. On Rosh Hashanah, we didn't really do very much, but that was the vacation from school, so that was fun. And uh, that, was, that was our Judaism. Now, what most people don't know is that when our Chachamim say something, they're serious. They're not uh, giving any advice lightly. So the Chachamim say that there's something called Yeridat Adorot, that each generation is lower in Kedusha than the one before it. So if the grandparents were Talmidei Chachamim, the ones that are one below them, the parents, are going to be slightly less, and the kids are going to be slightly less. If the grandparents talk business on Shabbat, they keep Shabbat. They don't drive on Shabbat, but they talk a little bit of business. They tell us each other, listen, you know, this building that I bought, you know, this uh, diamond that I bought. They talk business, but they don't actually do business. By the time it gets to the grandkid, the kid already does business on Shabbat. That's how it works, unfortunately. So my parents were, did not know that this is how it's going to work, so they sent us to public school. And little by little, we became like everybody else. We became goyim. Nagoim is not a derogatory word about non-Jews because Goim means Am, means a nation. Even Am Yisrael is called a nation. The only difference is in the Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Am Yisrael, you are going to be to me a Goy Kadosh. There's the Goy, and then there's Goy Kadosh. There's the nations, but then there's the holy nation. What distinguishes the nation from the holy nation? The holy nation has to keep 620 mitzvot. 
613 from the Torah, 7 from the rabbis. The non-Jews, the regular nations, they're fine. They have seven Noahide laws. They're much less. So they're not as holy as you. That's as simple as it gets. It's like, for example, you have an astronaut that went to school for a million years just to be an astronaut and one day be in space. And then there's the janitor. They're both perfectly fine people, but he has a higher responsibility. That's the difference between Jews and non-Jews. The problem is that the astronaut, if he becomes an astronaut, he maybe gets a bigger salary. But if he doesn't want to be an astronaut, there's no risk. There's nothing, no downside. He could be anything he wants. He could be a plumber. He could be a Wall Street banker. He could be anything he wants. A Jew, Arav Desler, Alav Shalom, says in Mikhtav Mi Eliyahu, a Jew doesn't have another option. A Jew is either a good Jew or a bad Jew. A Jew doesn't have an option of being a goy. He could be treated like one in heaven, meaning that he acts like it and he doesn't keep mitzvot. And in Shemaim, they're going to say, listen, you have a decree that you are uh, going to be treated like that. It's not good. Not, not, a, not a good report card. But if he wants to be a good Jew, if he wants to be a holy Jew, then he could bring light to the nations. So we didn't, do, we didn't know any of this stuff. So by the time I was 17, I went to college. I went to Binghamton University. I was a uh, 3.9 GPA. I did very good in school. I liked learning. I liked studying. But I didn't want to be in school for 100 years. So I decided to drop out of Binghamton University. And the reason why is because I realized that I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't want to be a lawyer. And I didn't want to be in school for many years. I wanted to make money. And already as a kid, when I was... 11, 12 years old, I already started working. By the time I was 17, I was selling all types of electronics. I was already making money. So going to, high, going to college and being surrounded by a bunch of guys that do drugs all day uh, in hopes that maybe by the fourth year they'll pick a major didn't really seem like fun to me. So I decided to go back into the business world. And eventually I joined a Wall Street firm to become a stockbroker. Now, even though we weren't religious, it didn't mean that we were crooks. So when I saw the first couple of firms that I worked for, within a matter of a couple of months, I realized there's something shady about this operation. They're uh, doing something wrong. So I left those places. Eventually, I went to a big firm, and I started working there. The problem is, on Wall Street, when, uh, you know, there's, there's, only, there's no middle class. It's either you're extremely successful or you're poor, as poor as dirt. There's nothing in the middle. There's nobody that's just making it. It's either you're really, really doing well, or you're hoping to survive this month. And that's where I was in the beginning. I was working for other people, trying to do as best as I can to learn the business, to make some money, and hopefully one day become just like them. This took me about three years. So for the first three years, I did what, what's called paying your dues, meaning you're pretty much just working for almost nothing, making everybody else rich except yourself. After three years, I, uh, the, uh, the owner of the branch said, okay, you know what, you can go on your own and uh, start your own book of business, your own clients, but just make sure that you pay the rent and the, uh, all the bills and all the fees for the office. I said, how much is that? He said, it's $4,000 a month. Do you have it? I said, uh, I have about $4. <laughs> I have about $4. Four B and so he said to me, how are you going to pay me the $4,000 in a month? I said, I don't know, but if I have to, I'll come up. I'll come up with the money. So for the first several months, I literally, every single penny that I made from these new clients uh, went to him. I also got a second job. I would work to, to make some extra money. So for the first six months, literally, I was as poor as dirt. I would have to borrow a dollar from this guy named Dimitri every day so I could buy a donut and coffee because that was what I could afford to eat for the day. And this was about six months. Each day I would have to sneak on a bus in order to get to Manhattan, an hour and a half each way, get to the office somewhere around 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, finish the day at around 1 o'clock in the morning because that was the uh, last, uh, last bus, get home by around 2, 2.30, sleep for a couple of hours and do it all over again the next day. That was for the first six months. And this is already three years into the business. Now, during this time, it was a very difficult economy because the market crashed and plus September 11th happened. So it wasn't exactly the best time to convince people to invest into the stock market. People were jumping out of windows. People weren't exactly happy about their financial advisors. But for me, I saw it as an opportunity. And the reason why is because since I didn't really have any clients, nobody hated me. 
But everybody hated their broker. Everybody hated their guy. So I was able to convince them to start doing business with me. While their broker was hiding from, uh, from anything, their clients, I was trying to capture clients and little by little getting them to do a little business with me and started making them some money and they became very happy. So by the time it got to November of 2002, just a year after I uh, started beca becoming an independent broker, I broke a company record and I made $116,000 in one month. So for me, this was like all the money in the world. I took most of it, bought my parents a house. The rest of it, I put a deposit on getting myself an apartment, renting an apartment in Manhattan so I don't have to spend three, four hours a day commuting and continued my life. But from that point on, life was never the same because all the clients that I've been getting over the last year were very happy. They made money with me, so they started sending me their friends. By the time I got to August of 2003, just about a year later, I became the number three top producing broker in the entire country for the company, which had about 5,000 people. The average person on that list was in the business for 25, 30 years. I was only in it for a couple of years. So at that moment, I decided that it's time for me to go and start my own company. So I started hiring a bunch of people, not that much older than you, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, 20 21-year-olds, some a little older, but most of them are very, very young. Like-minded people that wanted to work, wanted to make some money, had some analysts, had some brokers, salesmen, trained over 135 people to become good salesmen throughout my career. And all this time, just my top priority was business. I figured that I'm going to become the next Bill Gates. I'm going to become somebody that's going to do something good in the world, build buildings, build empires, build bridges, do something useful. Now, I didn't really care for money. I just liked making it. So when people come to me and ask me for money, I always gave it to them. Without really thinking, I have a policy to this day, Baruch Hashem. Anytime somebody comes to me and they're in need, I take whatever is the first bill in my pocket and I give it to them. Sometimes it's a dollar bill, sometimes it's a hundred, sometimes it's five. It doesn't make a difference. Whatever it is, that's how I give it. For my whole life, that's the way it's been. Now, this is a, uh, very easy when all you have is a dollar bills. But it becomes a little more difficult for people if you only have a hundred dollar bills. But if you realize that money is just a tool similar to a hammer, it doesn't mean much. So it's easy to give. So when people come to my office, different rabbis, different uh, communities, Jewish communities would come, ask for money. It was very easy for me to give because, again, I liked making it, not necessarily having it. Built the company, started doing extremely well, got to a point where on a bad month where we barely worked, maybe if I went on vacation for a few weeks and I only worked a few days, I'd still make a few hundred thousand dollars. By May of 2006, I broke my own record and I made $1.6 million for one month. Really, it was one day. Really, all of it was one day. But we counted for the whole month because technically I got paid at the end of the month. Now, at that point, money became simply nothing. It just became like sand, meaningless. Whatever you want, you buy. You don't even look at the price. You need something, you just press the button and it comes. You go to a store, you don't look at the prices. Like people go and they look at price tags. Oh, how much is this? Can you get a discount? You don't do it. Just, you want it, you just buy it. And sometimes I take my little brother, who's not so little anymore, take him shopping. And uh, he liked electronics. So I would take him to all these electronics. In those days, there was a store called Sharper Image. I don't know if they're still in business. I don't think they are. And uh, a few other stores that he liked. And I take him and say, okay, so what do you want? And he uh, said, I don't know, which one do I pick? I said, just pick everything. So as soon as he picked somebody, we just started just taking a bunch of it. Just take doubles, three times, four times. Why? Because maybe you like it. Have a few of it. That's how little money meant. Simply, if it makes you happy, go buy whatever you want. The problem is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you a neshama. And that neshama does not become happy with money. In fact, the more connected you are to money and material the sadder the neshama becomes. And the reason why is because the neshama knows that you're making a mistake, a very, very serious mistake. So that's why you see, for example, the U.S. government did a study a few years ago, I believe it was 2017, and they researched suicide, Shem Yachem, people that commit suicide. And they said that over 71% of people that kill themselves and decide that there's nothing to live for are middle and upper class people. Meaning that Suicide and depression is a rich person's problem. Poor people don't do it as often. Now I could explain it by divrei chazal. Let's say that why? Why is it that the uh, 
the rich person is much more likely to become depressed than the poor person. Because the rich person, he figures that he could buy whatever he wants, and he's still not happy. So now he doesn't know what to do. The poor guy always has hope. He says, listen, I'm unhappy now, but wait till I win the lotto. Then I'll be happy. He always has this fake dream that one day he's going to have a lot of money and that's going to make him happy. So he has some hope. The reality is that neither one of them is in the right direction. So what happened to me is that I started trying looking for different hobbies, different things to do. I like to uh, gamble. I like to do all types of things that would use my mind. I never did drugs or anything like that, but I would do anything that would stimulate my mind, read all types of philosophical books, all types of psychological books, study different subjects. But even this never made me happy. Now, so at that point, I figured maybe I should work on my health. I have all the money in the world. I went on vacation to Las Vegas for two months. I tried all the different things that people like to do. I'm still unhappy. So maybe if I uh, became a little healthier, that means that I'll be happier. So in November of 2006, I decided that it's time for me to have a surgery, an elective surgery, for something that annoyed me twice a year. It wasn't a heart problem, it wasn't a, a brain problem, it wasn't even a problem. It was just something that annoyed me that two-thirds of the population have, called hemorrhoids. Now, it's not really a big deal, and the reality is that it's a very common issue among every people. It's an everyday conversation. I went to a doctor, and the doctor said, listen, I've been doing it for 20 years, it's not a problem at all. You come to the doctor, you feel a little uncomfortable for a couple of days, which, by the way, means pain. And uh, you go back to work. I said, how long is it, am I going to be out of work? He's like, oh, you're going to be come to have the surgery on Wednesday. You're going to be back to work on Monday. So I figured at this point I'm making about $3,000 an hour. So how much is surgery is really going to cost me? I start doing the math. I said, you know what? Okay, let's do it. It's like a vacation. So now I thought that I'm going to get rid of this problem. So that way I'm going to not even be annoyed twice a year. That was my first mistake. I go to the surgery, and I don't wake up the same. Something went wrong in the surgery. Now, for anyone that's asking what went wrong, we are now almost 14 years, 13 and a half years after the surgery. They still haven't figured it out. But I'll give you some details of what happened. When I woke up out of the surgery, I was screaming and yelling, because I felt as if somebody's electrocuting me while they're cutting me open over and over again. But not cutting me open just in that part of the body, but the entire body. Simply everything. While being electrocuted. So I asked them to kill me. I asked them to, to you know, relieve me of my misery. My wife and my mom are crying hysterical right next to me. I asked them, please do me a favor and kill me. They didn't want to listen, unfortunately. <laughs> and... Uh, the doctors have no idea what's going on. They've never seen such a thing like before. They start giving me morphine to calm my body down. My body rejects it. It doesn't work. Then they ask my wife, is he a drug addict? And she says, no, he's actually anti-drugs. He sends some of his employees that have drug problems to rehab because he hates drugs so much. So the doctor says, so how come he does his body's not accepting it? She says to him, you're the doctor. So they give me more morphine, and it doesn't work. They give me more morphine, and it doesn't work. They give me more morphine. Five different doses of morphine, and then they say to my wife, ma'am, we're sorry. We gave him the most amount of morphine legally allowed. Everybody else would have already died two dosages ago. <laughs> if it doesn't work by now, there's nothing we can do. Hashem had mercy on me, and it worked. But only for a short period of time. My body calmed down enough to give these doctors the genius idea. Let's get him out of here. So he said, sir, you're perfectly fine. Something went wrong, but obviously you're calmed down right now. So just go home, relax. It's all behind you. I said to myself, well, I suffered so much over this last hour or two hours, what seemed like a lifetime. It's calm. I feel fine. I can walk. Okay. See you guys later. This is what Ganom looks like. This is what hell looks like. Okay, so at least I have a nice uh, visual. And I leave. We go on the way home. We pick up some shualma. And uh, we get to the house. I lived in Manhattan. I lived on uh, Battery Park City. And uh, on the 19th floor over there, looking at the uh, Hudson River. And uh, we had our sandwiches. 
I told everybody, thank you everybody for coming. It was an adventure. But I'm going to sleep now. And see you tomorrow. I went to sleep. And I woke up about 45 minutes later. Because the morphine wore off. But this time, the screaming didn't stop. It didn't stop after an hour. It didn't stop after two hours. It didn't stop after 10 pills of painkillers. It didn't stop after 20 pills of painkillers. It didn't stop after 50 pills of painkillers. It just didn't stop for 62 days. Now, when you're in that much pain, you can't sleep. And when you can't sleep, you start dying. Slowly and viciously. And the only thing that would calm me down is creating different pain. So I would put boiling water on different parts of my body which could create different pain in order to numb this pain. And that would give me enough rest that I would sleep for 15 minutes. And then wake up in massive pain again and scream and yell and eventually it would work again and over and over again. Now after doing this for a few days and not being able to sleep for more than 15 minutes, your body starts to fail. And when your body starts to fail, it's not like the movies or uh, some uh, fairy tale story. It doesn't look good. So you start undoing what's supposed to be done in a good way. Things that are supposed to be stay in your body start leaving your body. Like, for example, blood. Blood, as long as it's inside your body, it's a good sign. Once it starts leaving your body, it's not usually a good sign, especially if it starts leaving through your eyes. So I started bleeding from every hole in my body. I'm sorry for being graphic, but this just gives you an idea of what it means to be really sick. So everybody, when they say, Asher Yatzal, after you go to the bathroom, you thank Hashem for being healthy, that's what you're thanking Him for. And I brought you a bunch of free posters in the back, along with many CDs, that could remind you every day that you're able to go to the bathroom, every day that you're able to be healthy, to thank Hashem for being healthy. Because not being healthy is not a good look. So everything that could fail, fails. My liver starts failing. My eyes start bleeding. My ears start getting infected. I'm not able to walk. I'm barely able to speak. Life is hell. I go to the hospital every other day. They make it worse than what it was. Long story short, this continues for a couple of months. After a couple of months, it start, the pain starts subsiding. And I start going back to my life. Now I still have to take painkillers, about 20 to 25 a day. But nonetheless, it's much better than the hell I was living for the last couple of months. Now at this point, I figure that I have a bad luck, but good luck. Bad luck that the whole thing happened to me, but good luck that it's better now. Okay, I have some pain, but it's much better than before, so you look at life that way. I'm not thinking, oh, do I have to do tshuva? Oh, maybe I should start praying every day. Oh, maybe I should start keeping Shabbat. None of this ever had, never, none of this came to my mind. The reason why is because I had different rabbis come to my office every week, three times a week. Every week, three different types of rabbis will come to my office. They ask me, Tzedakah, I give them Tzedakah. Sometimes I pay their mortgage. Sometimes I pay their rent. Sometimes I pay for camp. Sometimes I pay for something that I didn't even know what it was. But every time they came, I gave them the money. I had it, they needed it. Baruch Hashem, why not? Not one time did anybody ever say, by the way, Yaron, maybe you should start keeping Shabbat. By the way, Yaron, maybe you should start keeping kosher. Not only in the house, outside the house also. You know, because Hashem is inside the house and outside the house. You know, some people, they keep kosher, but they keep kosher only inside the house. As soon as they go outside, they start eating taref. Or they say, no, no, I only eat, I only eat salads in non-kosher places. I only eat salads in non-kosher places. They think that's okay. By the way, you eat salads in non-kosher places, you should do not bore uh, priyadama, shakol. Why shakol? Because there's bugs. The bugs in the, in the salad, at shakol. At shakol. It's not, that's, it's not from adama. Because the, because the non-Jews do not have to wash their vegetables like we do. So if you eat salad in a non-kosher place, there's very likely two, three, four, five hundred different bugs that went in there. For them, it's not a problem. Some of them eat bugs on purpose. You go to Chinatown, Go to Chinatown, you have entire markets. They sell you all types of cockroaches and things like that. That's, that's not a problem for them. No, I'm serious. That's some people, that's what they like. That's their diet. They say it's protein. There's actually a new chocolate. There's a new chocolate they sell in America. They call it organic. Why organic? It's made from cockroaches. For them, it's okay. For us, it's not okay. Ami says, not allowed to eat stuff like this. Now, this is a reality. 
This doesn't make you good or bad. This is the difference. Hashem says, Jews, not allowed to eat bugs. Non-Jews, eat bugs, eat whatever you want as long as it's not alive. That's seven Noahide laws. As long as it's not alive, don't eat it. Don't be vicious. Eat the animal while it's still alive. As long as it's not alive, eat whatever you want. Jews, you can't eat whatever you want. It has to have split, split hooves and chew its cud. If it's an animal, if it's a fish, it has to have fish, fins and scales and so on and so forth. So now, I have all these different rabbis, all these different religious people come to my office on a regular basis and not a single person ever tells me, maybe you should change your life, maybe you should do this, maybe you should do that. So it never came to my mind that maybe I should change my life. I figured that I'm fine. I'm generous. I help people that need help. I'm a perfectly fine pe- person with uh, bad luck. So Hashem didn't agree with me. How do I know? Because nine months later, after this nightmarish surgery, I have a new pain. Different body part. Back of my leg. But this pain is not like a regular pain. In the beginning, I thought I pulled a muscle. By the next day, I couldn't walk. By the next day, I was in such massive pain, I had to go to the emergency room. And then they told me, uh, we have good news and bad news. I said, okay, what's the uh, good news? He said, the good news is you're not dead. Uh, okay, well, so it's, uh, thanks. I uh, kind of knew that without you, but okay, fine. I said, what's the bad news? He said, you're probably going to be in an hour if you don't do a surgery. I said, what happened? He says, you have an infection that's about to explode inside two muscles. If it explodes, it's going to go into your blood system. Within an hour, you're dead. I said, okay, so uh, that doesn't really leave me that many choices, does it? They didn't find me so funny, though. Anyway, we had a surgery... This surgery was much more difficult than the first one because here I had to stay in the intensive care unit for three weeks. Now, an intensive care unit is pretty much where uh, 50-50 if you're going to make it. My father, God bless him, is, uh, was in the intensive care unit for the last few days. He had a mini stroke, but Baruch Hashem, he's doing better. And it's not a fun place. When I went to visit him last night, you know, it brings back memories of uh, things that you don't want to remember, but you have to. So I have intensive care unit, morphine constantly connected to me, all types of doctors giving me shots. You're not allowed to sleep for more than an hour because they have to do something. After a a month or so, a month and a half of this, they relieve me from the hospital. I go back home. The recovery is very difficult. But again, I just figure I have bad luck. Hashem didn't agree. Six months later, new pain. New infection, different body part. I'm back in the hospital. They said, we have good news and bad news. I said, ah, forget the good news and bad news. Just do the surgery, right? I know, you, I know your story already. I was like, oh, you heard this before? <laughs> said, I have to have a surgery, don't I? They said, immediately. Okay, put you to sleep, have another surgery. You wake up not knowing where you are. You're connected to all types of tubes, oxygen, Not so much fun. Almost another month of this stuff. Go back home. Same unlucky person. Try to go back to work. Try to go back to making money. Three months later. I'm back in the hospital. Good news and bad news. Another surgery. One month later. Another surgery. Another month later. Another surgery. And then it gets to a point where I'm in a doctor or a hospital every single week. I'm in pain 24 hours a day. No Shabbat for the pain, no Shabbat for me either. No break for the pain, no break for me either. 24 hours a day, once in a while the pain subsides for a few days or even a few weeks, but then it goes back with a vengeance. And life turns upside down when you're not able to work. You're not able to make money. The business starts going down. The people that I thought were my friends become enemies. They start taking my company down, start stealing stuff, start stealing clients, all types of wonderful things. This company that at one point was worth $45 million literally becomes ashes. Somebody wanted to buy the company, but it ended up, the deal ended up going uh, sour as the market crashed and uh, my life crashed. And literally everything that I used to touch, that used to turn to gold, is now going back from turning gold back to ashes. 
everything fails. I'm losing money faster than I made it. I'm spending every penny that I have on different types of doctors. And over the next seven years, I go to over 50 different doctors just to try to diagnose the problem. Forget about curing it. Just figure out what happened. Why can't I walk? Why can't I function? Why am I constantly in pain in different body parts that have no association whatsoever to the original body part? Like, why is my leg numb? Why is my leg all of a sudden get shooting pain? Why does my arm hurt? They're not connected to that body part. No one can explain it. I start becoming a uh, study as part of a research where they start investigating my body, start giving me different types of medicine just to see what works. Some of it is for free because they're benefiting from the study. Some of it I have to pay for. And since I had money, I was willing to try everything. And trust me when I tell you when you're sick and you're in pain, money becomes literally worthless. Now over this time, there's not a thought in my mind about, oh, I wish I was successful. Oh, I wish I became richer. Oh, I wish that, uh, you know, I had more uh, buildings. None of this stuff actually matters. The only thing I wish is I wish I was normal. I wish that I didn't scream and yell every time I woke up or every time I moved. And it became very uncomfortable to be next to me because literally you'd sit next to me, we're sitting together, everything is calm, and all of a sudden I'm screaming and yelling out of nowhere for no reason because I have pain, but you can't see pain. It's not like there's blood gushing out. It's just a lot of pain and you can't see it. And it becomes very uncomfortable for people. Similar to some of the things that I say to you that are uncomfortable to hear, but that's reality. Life is not always comfortable. So now, I get to a point where life becomes very meaningless to me, and I start praying to Hashem, and I say, I know I have no solution from doctors, but what do I do? So my mom gave me some Taylin books, and told me, why don't you read this? I tried it a few times, didn't really work for me. Somebody told me, why don't you go to Shiul Torah, there's such and such rabbi. I tried going to the Shiul Torah. I'd go there at 9 o'clock at night. Five minutes later, I'd fall asleep. By the time I woke up, the Shiul was over. Couldn't connect. Couldn't do it. I tried all types of things, but I thought that maybe uh, there's like some type of like magic potion that if I do something, then it'll work. So maybe if I donate a lot of money, That'll work. So I donated a Sefer Torah. We had a Sefer Torah made in Eretz Yisrael. Cost like sixty, seventy thousand dollars 70000 I figured, oh, I brought a Sefer Torah. This is a great thing. It's big Kiddush Hashem, big mitzvah. That should solve my pain. It got much worse. Nothing changed. I said, okay, so maybe if I start putting tefillin on. Put tefillin on a few times a week. Put tefillin on. That should work. I do that. Nothing changed. Thank you. Just give me this Nothing changed. In fact, it gets worse. Everything I do keeps getting worse. And the reason is, Rabotai, is because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Kedoshim to you ki kadosh ani. You be holy because I am holy. Being holy is not a magic potion. Being holy is not something you can just press a button and you become holy. If a person touches a Sefer Torah, he doesn't become holy. The Sefer Torah is holy. The person stays the same. If he was holy before he touched the Sefer Torah, he's, he stays holy. If he's not holy, he stays not holy. The Tzav Adar does not make a person holy. Rav Wasam Alav Shalom said, but if you look at Tum'ah, at impurity, if a person is holy or just neutral, if that even exists, and he touches something Tameh, he touches Tum'ah, he becomes not pure. He becomes impure. Meaning that to become impure, to become defiled, according to the Torah, is very easy. Or if a person touches a dead body, or something that's impure, it becomes impure. But to become holy, you can't just do it by touching something. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Kedoshim tiyu ki kadosh ani. You be holy because I am holy. Meaning, you have to raise yourself and act like me. Be generous like me. Be forgiving like me. Be good like me, follow the Torah like me, then you'll be holy, just like me. But just to think that just because you were born Jewish, or you were born a woman, or you were born a man, or you were born some way or another, that's going to make you holy by default? Absolutely not. It doesn't make you. Why? Because you could be a good Jew, you could be a bad Jew. 
You could be a good non-Jew. You could be a bad non-Jew. It's simple. You want to be holy? You have to work on it. There's no easy get out of jail free card where you can just press a button and all of a sudden everything works. So that's the part I never knew. I thought that if I just do one big act, it's going to work. It didn't work. One day my mom sees me and she realizes that I'm becoming suicidal. I'm not really healthy psychologically or physically. She starts calling different rabbis all over the world, trying to ask for brachot. She goes to Israel, talks to different rabbis. She starts making different phone calls. And one day she starts, she has a little book of different rabbis' phone numbers from all over the place. She starts calling them. She calls one number after another, one number after another. For an hour and a half, nobody picks up. All of a sudden, all the, rab- all the rabbis went on vacation. Eventually, after an hour and a half, she calls a number in Eretz Israel, and a woman picks up. And she asks, is Rabbi so-and-so there? And the woman says, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Hebrew, uh, but it's the wrong number. Now, my mom, after trying to get a rabbi on the phone just for a simple bracha, for almost two hours, she finally got to somebody, but it's the wrong number, she breaks down. She starts crying hysterical to this strange woman. Now, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to give you tests because you need to become holy. You need to get to a higher level and you need to overcome these tests in order to do that. But I'm not going to break you. I'm only going to give you tests you can handle. And as soon as you're at that breaking point, that's when I'll come to save you. My mom was getting to that breaking point. She starts hysterical crying to a strange woman and Hashem shows up on the spot. That strange woman wasn't so strange after all because she identified my mom's voice and she says, Doris, which is my mom's name. My mom is shocked. She stops crying immediately. She says, who are you? How do you know my name? She says, it's Penina, your niece. She says, Penina, how did I get to you? I don't have your phone number and we've never ever talked on the phone. She says, I don't know how you got to me, but if you got to me, that means that Hashem wants us to talk. She was the only part of our entire family on both sides that's actually religious. She says, why are you crying? She says, listen, my son, everybody knows he's not doing good. Well, truth is, he's doing worse than not good. He's dying. I need somebody to help him. I want to talk to some big rabbi, somebody. She says, why don't you talk to my brother? Rabbi Fahim. He lives a couple of buildings away from Rav At the time, Rav was still alive. Maybe you could talk to the Rav. Maybe you could do something. Call him. She says, I'll talk to me. She goes, of course I'll talk to you. You're uh, Aunt Doris from America. <laughs> you know, of course I'll talk to you. So she calls Rav Ephraim. Rav Ephraim is in the kollel. He calls her back. And Rav Ephraim and I have a, almost a 10-year difference between us. So when, I, when we left America, when we left Israel, I didn't even know who he was. He was a baby. So I never knew he existed. So he talks to my mom. Within a matter of minutes, he asked my mom, can I just speak to him directly? And he says, uh, I don't think so. She goes, why not? He says, because he doesn't want to speak to anybody anymore. At that very moment that she says, he doesn't speak to anybody, I only found this out obviously later. At that very moment, I decided out of the blue to call my mom on the other line. And I call my mom and I hear her crying hysterical and I ask her, why are you crying? And she says, talk to him, talk to him. I said, to who? He says, to Ephraim. I said, who's Ephraim Bechlal? And why is he making you cry, this guy? <laughs> so she says to me, oh, it's your cousin. He's a tzaddik. He's a this. He's a that. I said, okay, listen, if it's going to stop you from crying, have him call me. I'll talk to whoever you want. Just stop crying for heaven's sake. <laughs> so Rabbi Ephraim calls me. And right off the bat, he asks me, he's like, do you like stories? I said, sure, why not? He said, oh, I'll tell you a story. And he tells me the story of Yudai and Tamal. Now, for years, I never knew why he picked this story out of all the stories in the world, but the Gemara in Masechet Megillah says that it took Am Yisrael 40 years to understand what Moshe Rabbeinu said to them. They understood plainly what he said, but the deeper message took them 40 years until they got to the end of the desert to finally understand. And from there, we learn that sometimes it's going to take us 40 years to truly understand what the rabbi's message really is. That's why till this day, for example, people are still learning from the Rebbe's messages from 30 years ago. The message never changed. It was the same message 30 years ago. It's just that we're understanding it after going over it, over it, over it, over it, over it so many times. Eventually our neshama becomes more and more purified 
that we could truly understand the deeper message. So he tells me the story. I find it very fascinating. So I start asking him questions. And he makes me feel good about my question. He says, wow, that's a fantastic question. You know who asked the same question? I said, no. He says, Rabbi such and such asked the same question 850 years ago. And the answer is written in this book on this page. And I said to myself, how does he know the book by heart? On the page number too. I never knew that's how Tamidei Chachamim think. They know page numbers. They know book names. So I said, oh, maybe he just happens to have the book in front of him. So he answers the question. So I ask another question. He says, what a wonderful question you have. You know who said the same question? I said, no. He says, Rabbi so-and-so, different rabbi, in this book 420 years ago, on this book, on this page number, and this is what it says. I said, what's the chances that he has both books in front of him? (laughs) So I ask him another question, and he says the same thing. I said, how do you have all these books? He goes, I don't have the books in front of me. I said, so how do you know the answers? He says, because you asked the question, and Hashem gave me the answer. So what do you mean Hashem gave you the answer? I never understood this stuff. It took me a while to understand what does it mean. Siyat Dishmaya. Siyat Dishmaya means special assistance from heaven. You ask a Talmud Chacham a question, doesn't matter if he knows or he doesn't know, Hashem gives him the answer if there's a real significance for somebody to know this answer. We have a teenager program in uh, Florida three times a week, but the Wednesday shiul, the Wednesday program is questions and answers. 40, 50 kids come to the shiul, all ages, 14, 18, 19, some of them are even approaching 20, and they ask any question they want. And I tell them, ask anything you want, Mr. Hashem, I'll provide you the answer. He said, so you have all the books? I said, no, I don't have all the books. He said, you have all the answers? I said, no, I don't have all the answers. So, so how are you going to ask the question? How are you, you going to know the answers? He said, no, if you really need to know the answer, Hashem's going to give me the answer and I'll answer the question. And if not, that means I don't have any schuyot and shamayim, so I'll just have to pay you 50 bucks. <laughs> Why? Because, I'm sorry, I, can't, I don't have enough schuyot to give you the answer. So people come to this you and Baruch Hashem, so far I haven't paid anybody 50 bucks. But that's the program. You come to this you ask, stump the rabbi. If the rabbi has the answer, good. Then we move on to the next step. If he doesn't have the answer, at least you benefit. You get a few dollars in your pocket. So anyway, I start asking questions for an hour and 40 minutes. We'll go up and He gives me answers. It's unbelievable. For the first time in my life, I ask questions and somebody gives me answers with sources. Not just opinions, not just his, uh, you know, what he thinks. Like something that's written in a book and he can prove it to me. So I like the conversation and I can't wait for him to call me again. Next week, he calls me. Thursday, 4 o'clock, we speak for three hours. Same thing. Questions and answers. I ask questions, all types of questions, whether it's about dinosaurs or chemistry or business or marriage, anything and everything I come up with. I didn't even know I had so many questions. But if I have answers, might as well ask. Next week, Thursday, 4 o'clock, 5 hours. Questions and answers. Next week, Thursday, 4 o'clock, 7 hours. And then it becomes every Thursday, 4 o'clock, 7 hour conversation. My wife knows at that moment, every Thursday, office shuts off at 4 o'clock. Why? Yaron is learning to all have a fine. The whole world could explode. Don't bother your own on Thursday, 4 o'clock. He's getting answers. She was the biggest promoter of this shoe, as if she was some Rabbanit. <laughs> now, we do this for the next nine months. Over this time, I start learning different things, getting a lot of answers, started keeping different mitzvot. One day, the rabbi tells me, he's like, uh, you know you have to start keeping Shabbat. He said, uh, well, I don't work on Shabbat. I just go to the casino. He says, no, you're not allowed to go to the casino. I said, why? But it's resting, no? He said, no, it's not, doesn't, resting doesn't mean going to the casino. It doesn't mean not working. And he starts explaining to me Shabbat. I have a few excuses, but eventually I realized that I'm full of excuses. I said, okay, no problem. I'll start keeping Shabbat. So I start keeping Shabbat. I start keeping kosher. I start learning Torah. More than just that Thursday at, seven, at uh, 4 o'clock for 7 hours. I start learning a little bit every day. 15 minutes a day. Then it becomes a half hour a day. Then it becomes a little bit more. Each day I increase a little more. And then one day, he calls me and he says, listen, I just found a chidush. Chidush is like a new insight in the Torah. Now, it's not a really a chidush, but he wanted, to me, he wanted me to feel good. So it's like as if he just discovered it, and that's why he didn't tell me till now. And he says, uh, listen, the Zohar says that... Uh, if you're married to a non-Jew, 
lot of problems are going to happen to you. Now, we already know this from Sefer Bereshit, but he wanted to make it seem like he just found this out. I didn't know this. So I said, okay, what do you mean? He says, well, if you're married to a non-Jew, you're going to lose all your money and you're going to get sick. I said, who said this? He said, Rabbi Meir. He said, ah, Rabbi Meir, what does he know anyway? I don't know who Rabbi Meir is. So I said, what does he know? What is he talking about? Why? Why am I so offended by this? Why do I care what Rabbi Meir says? Why am I? Everything else he said. Keep Shabbat, no problem. Keep kosher, no problem. Give tzedakah, no problem. Learn Torah, no problem. Whatever you want, I'm doing. But now all of a sudden, nine months later, he tells me, listen, Rabbi Meir says such and such, and it's all, and all of a sudden I have all the problems in the world. Because everybody loves the truth until it obligates them. And for the first time, I heard something that obligates me. What does it obligate me to do? Get a divorce. Because I'm married to a non-Jew. Now, all this time that I'm going through surgeries, the only person that's helping me is my wife. The only person that tolerates me is my wife. The only person that's supporting me is my wife. Obviously my mom also, to the best of our abilities, but as far as friends, co-workers, all this other stuff, everybody disappeared, ran away. Every time there's a surgery, recovery, she's my personal nurse. Every time I'm depressed, I want to jump out of a window, she's the one that encouraged me not to jump. She's the best thing in the world. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to divorce this. Go find me somebody like her. So I said, is there another way? He says, well, listen, I mean, conversion is allowed if she wants to convert on her own, though. I said, okay, sure. Well, what's the, what's the, what does it take? What do we have to do to convert? She goes, well, she just has to abandon her beliefs, whatever belief she has, and she has to learn Torah, fulfill the mitzvot, and that's it. So I told my wife, because she's been learning with me all, all this time also, and I said, well, listen, why don't you, uh, what do you believe? We never really had this conversation. And uh, she said, well, she had some crazy belief, you know, some version of Christianity. Some guy died 2,000 years ago, and uh, that makes him a good person and therefore absolves you from any mitzvot. <laughs> oh, a lot of people die every day. According to statistics that I read one time, 18 million people die every year. 18 million people die every year. How come nobody starts a new religion? I don't understand. Why does somebody dying 2,000 years ago absolve somebody today of mitzvot? I never understood this. But for some reason, people have an excuse for everything. So 2,000 years ago, some guy that according to our Torah was not exactly a good person, actually a very evil person, he died, and therefore they canceled the Torah. So I said, Man, this doesn't make any sense. Why don't you just throw this in the garbage? She says, listen. You can't just stop believing something. So that's when I realized, okay, so you can't just stop believing. We can't just stay the same. So what do you do? I said, so the only way is that we have to find out what's the truth. I like Torah, but I'm not 100% it's sure that this is it. I figured that Torah is number one, Christianity is number two, and uh, the Muslims somewhere along the lines. I figured they're all okay. You know, like uh, equal opportunity. They're all okay, but they all have their own versions. None of them, the other ones really made sense to me. Torah is the only one that made sense to me. But at this point, I'm not like 100% in. Hashem says, know that I'm God. Not believe that I'm God. Only once in the Torah, he says, believe that I'm God. The rest of the time, he says, know that I'm Hashem. So, I didn't know yet. So, I said, well, how do you get to knowledge? So, then I started to see, okay, let's see. If Christianity is true, then we're going there. If it's not, then we're obviously all going to be Jews. So I started learning about Christianity. And within a very, very short period of time, I realized that Christianity is not only non -true, not true, but it's the biggest falsehood that's ever hit this earth. It's 100% idol worship. It's 100% the opposite of Torah. And now that I know this, I simply have to show it to her. Little by little, we start learning together. She starts finding things on her own, and she starts realizing, yes, this belief is shaky. There's something wrong with it. But I still need some type of sign from Hashem that He wants me to become a Jew. I, she already got to a point where Christianity is uh, not really the same thing. But still, is this really the will of Hashem? Is it not? So we continue learning, we continue doing mitzvot, we continue growing. And then one day we discover a debate by Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi against the Christian professor. 
someone that trains different uh, priests and reverends and so on. I watch the whole three, four hours of it. I love it. I try to show it to her. She doesn't uh, like the uh, debate so much. She only watched the first two parts. But then we find another movie by the same Rabbi Mizrahi, and it's called Torah and Science. Now, this movie has changed the lives of countless people who actually watched it objectively. Now, if you watch it and it's just in the background like music, it's not going to do anything for you. But if you watch it and actually listen to what he says, and you'll see how you could literally scientifically prove the Torah, prove that God exists, prove that 100% emet and everything else is shekel. It's not just about believing that the Torah is good and the Torah is helpful and the Torah is true, but it's also a clear understanding that everything else is nonsense. So we watched a couple of parts out of the three, and then by part three, my wife gets to a part where it talks about Torah codes. And in there, he provides different Torah codes which are hidden secrets within our Torah where Hashem gave us messages. Now over the last 60 years, different professors and mathematicians have been able to uncover many of these Torah codes, different secrets in our Torah. And this Torah code is one of the most exceptional ones where Hashem says a prophecy about the end of times. What's going to happen before Mashiach? He says, before Mashiach, Am Yisrael is not going to be uh, exactly tzaddikim. We're going to make a lot of mistakes. And as a punishment, He's going to send us to the four corners of the world. To America, to Africa, Europe, all over the world. There's going to be Jews everywhere. There's good and bad in this. But nonetheless, in those places, we're going to be confused. And now, in those places, some of the Jews are going to stop worshipping the, the God of wood and the God of stone. So we know God of wood is the cross. God of stone is Mecca, the stone that the uh, Arabs uh, worship. But then inside that verse, there's a Torah code that gives the name of those two religions, Christianity and Islam. For Christianity, it actually has the name for their God, Yimach Shimo Vizicho, Yeshu. And then for Islam, he has the uh, word of their place, which is Mecca, which is where they worship. So here we have a very clear sign what Hashem doesn't like, what Hashem considers the opposite of the truth. Now, I've, I've seen Torah codes by this point, but for her, this was the sign. So at that point, she decides that this is the sign she needs. We continue learning little by little. We start becoming more and more religious. We Obviously, all of the beliefs of the past, whether it's secularism or anything else, is abandoned. But eventually, we get to a point where we get to the Bedin, convert, get married, Baruch Hashem, in a kosher way, and go back to business. Now, I'm still sick, and uh, money is running out the window. But I still have a few hundred thousand dollars. Now, at this moment... I st my rabbi told me, listen, why don't you start uh, sharing the message? I said, what message? He said, your, your story, different things that you learn, share it with other people. I said, but I don't really know him very much. He says, whatever you know, teach. You learn every day. Whatever you learn, teach it. So I started doing a shiur once a week. I invite some people to my house every Tuesday. And they'd come at 8, 9 o'clock at night. And I'd give them a shiur about Parashat Shavua. We're almost done. And uh, so I started with one guy, and I told him, listen, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to tell you what God said. You do whatever you want. I'm not judge. I'm not jury. I don't really, it doesn't affect me what you do. I'm just going to tell you what God says, and you do what you want. He said, okay, fair enough. After the first shoe, at one point in the shoe, I said, you know what? Uh, God says that if you drive on Shabbat, you have a very serious problem. So he looks at me funny. He says, what do you mean? He says, well, God says no fire. And car is fire. It's a lot of fires. So he says to me, wait, yeah, but you're allowed to drive to shul though, right? I said, no, no, you're not allowed to drive, period. Unless you drive into a hospital, it's pikuach nefesh. He says, what do you mean? I've been driving to shul for 20 years. How come nobody ever told me this? I said, I don't know. Nobody ever told me either. I had rabbis come to my office three times a week for 15 years. You do the math how many times they had an opportunity to tell me the truth. And unfortunately, they didn't tell me the truth. I don't know why. 
Maybe it was money, maybe it was this, maybe it was that. It doesn't make a difference. Point is that now you know. Now you know. These people, sometimes they have a Yetzirah, sometimes Yetzirah top. It doesn't make a difference. Now you know. Hashem gave you the message. You are not allowed to drive. You want to drive? Drive. But now you know you're not allowed. You don't want to drive. And then you have a solution. So, he was the first student. The next week we had two people. Same thing. Next week we had three people. Little by little we started building it, started putting the uh, lectures online. People started watching it. People started sending messages that it's helping their life. From all walks of life, people from Australia, from England, from Israel, from all places, they would watch these shuim on YouTube, and they say that this Baal Tshuva, brand new person to the religion, is influencing them. I was amazed. But, you know, still, my plan was to work, make some money, rebuild my business life, and, you know, do something good, teach Torah once a week. I never planned on being a speaker or starting an organization or anything like that. I figured this is what Hashem wants me to do, something good in your life. Well, when Hashem wants to give you a message, He makes sure that it's very, very clear. So He had to destroy all of my business hopes. After some time of giving shulim and becoming a little bit more popular with people, getting a few people to learn on a regular basis, Hashem gave me a clear message. On a Tuesday at 9 o'clock in the morning, we found out we had a small fund that we were investing our money and other people's money. It wasn't very much, but still it was a few hundred thousand dollars that we had left, which is pennies in comparison to what the millions that we used to have, but still it's enough to live and have a business. Well, at 9 o'clock, we found out that our biggest investment just announced horrible news. The market was overreacting as it is. What's going to happen doesn't look very good. At 9.30 in the morning is when the market opens. At 9.36, the balance of my account is zero. Nothing. Nothing left. Zero balance. The bank sells all the investments. Everything is. We literally have a zero balance. 9.36 in the morning. I have a shiur later that night. Now at this point, Baruch Hashem, I've arrived at the conclusion, not an assumption, not an ideology, not a hope or a dream, but I arrived at the conclusion that Hashem runs the world. And if this is what He wants, perfect. So at 9.36 is what happened. At 9.37, the computer turns off. I say, Hashem Natan, Hashem Lakach, Ishem Hashem Evorach, which is what Eyov said after Hashem took all of his money, all of his kids, all of his this, and everything that he had. He said, Hashem gave, Hashem took, may his name be blessed. Why? It's his anyway. He decided to take it back. Okay, it's yours. I have a shield to do. Shut off the computer, go learn from my shield. The guys that came to the shield that night didn't even know anything happened. We had a shield to run. To this day, those guys don't know what happened that day. But all of a sudden, everybody saw that I don't work anymore on, on, on Wall Street. All of a sudden, I'm not doing business anymore. All of a sudden, I'm doing more shiurim. All of a sudden, I'm studying all day. All of a sudden, the only thing that matters in my life is Torah. Now, how are we going to pay the bills? I said, listen, Hashem wants me to help people do tshuva. Hashem wants me to give people chizuk. So that's what I'll do. I'll do this 24 hours a day. As long as I'm awake, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put shiurim, my shiurim, Rabbi Fahim shiurim, try to spread the message. I'll do this. Money, that's his problem. How are we going to pay the bills? That's his problem. We don't ask for tzedakah, but obviously people donate. We don't charge for lectures, but sometimes people give us for the travel. Sometimes people give us for the cause. Sometimes people don't give it all. It doesn't really make a difference. Why? I know that I'm going to do what Hashem says. The rest of the problems are His. And this is how we've been living for the last six years. Now, I can tell you that if you come to my house in Florida... You're going to think I'm still a millionaire and I'm lying a little bit. Because my house is a nice house. My kids, Baruch Hashem, are well fed. My wife is very happy. Our life looks like a regular person that's perhaps even doing really well. But if I show you my bank account, you're going to start laughing. I say, are you serious? This is this? <laughs> it has to be like a secret account. No, it's no secret account. If you look at what we're doing on the internet and different places, how much money we're giving to people, we just uh, did a, uh, uh, a giveaway in, in Eretz Israel. 200 families that are poor families, we gave them all types of ma'achalei chalav. 
milk products for Shavuot. No, you're not talking about millions of dollars. You're talking about, you know, some, a few thousand dollars. But the point is, is that we try to literally do good everywhere we can. For Pesach, we did for about 450, 500 families. We give out CDs for free. We give out the Shei Yitzhak cards for free. Everything is free. Of course, people donate, but we don't have any major campaigns. We don't have a, uh, you know, a charge for lectures. We simply do our job. And it works. Because at the end of every lecture... No matter whether you liked what I said or you don't like what I said, you arrive at a couple of conclusions, and that's when we'll finish. One conclusion is that everything that I said when it comes to the Torah is verified. You could check, you could see the verse, you could see the Gemara, you could look at the page. It's not something for my opinion. It's not my shita, my strategy, or I'm Sephardi and he's Ashkenazi, or I'm Ashkenazi and you're Sephardi, I'm Chabad and he's Breslov, none of that stuff. I don't care about any of that stuff. I care about Judaism. Good. What does the Torah say? What does God say? Not what Yeroen Uven says. I always tell people, don't judge Judaism based on the Jews. Because sometimes they're not exactly the best representatives of Judaism. Judge Judaism based on Torah. What does it say in the Torah? What's God's opinion? Once you look at God's opinion, that's all you need. Why? Because his opinion doesn't change. So everything we say in the Torah, we try to quote where it says it in the Torah, whether it's in the Chumash or Tanakh or it's in a... Uh, different gemarot. The second thing is that people arrive at the conclusion is they realize we literally have no interest. We're not coming to become popular because if we did, we tell people that they're doing perfectly fine because that's the popular thing to do today. Tell everybody that tzaddikim. You're tzaddik. Yeah, but you know I drive on Shabbat. Yeah, yeah, but Hashem knows that you can't, uh, you know, they make all types of excuses. You realize that there's no excuse. There's no, I'm not trying to become popular. All we're trying to do is give you a message that Hashem wants you to know. You follow it. Baruch Hashem. You don't follow it. You don't follow it. But also, most importantly, to know that Hashem, when He gave us the Torah, He meant business. He's serious. We may not take Him seriously sometimes, but He's serious. Now, anyone that read the Parashat Shavua last week, Parashat Bechukotai, and reads about the punishments that are in there, they're very heavy punishments. Which means that Hashem is not joking. Anyone that looks at the story of what happened in my life realizes this happens. Not just to me. It happened to other people. Now punishment is not necessarily a bad thing. If you look at it the right way. Hashem is not trying to punish us because He wants to hurt us. Hashem punishes us because He's trying to get our attention. Now if you continue doing good, you have his attention, he has your attention, perfect relationship. Of course, you can have ups and downs in life, that's life, there's trials, there's tribulations, but in general, perfect relationship. But when somebody abandons Hashem, somebody decides that I'm going to do something else, somebody decides that maybe I'm going to do this, maybe I'm going to do that, that's the opposite of what Hashem says. Hashem says, I have to give you a sign. So I'm going to send you a text message, and I'm going to send you a WhatsApp, I'm going to send you a Facebook message, I'm going to send you, a, you know, an email, I'm going to have somebody send you a letter, I'm going to have somebody knock on your door. I'm going to bring a CD. He's going to send you messages in different ways. Whether it's from a rabbi or a CD or a shiu or some, you know, something's going to happen. He's going to send us messages many, many times. Sometimes those messages hurt. But if we understand that the ultimate purpose of that message is to get our attention in order for us to do good for ourselves, then the reality is we realize that it's just like a parent that cares about their kid. And sometimes that kid is not so smart. He wants to put his fingers inside the electric socket because it looks like fun. Because he's only three, four years old and the electric socket looks like it's a perfect fit for his little finger. <laughs> but the parent knows that if he puts it there, he's not coming out the same. So after he yells at the, at the kid and the kid doesn't respond, he knows that he can't continue yelling again. He has to do something else. That something else may be pulling the kid. And pulling the kid may hurt the kid a little bit. But it's better to hurt the kid a little bit than the kid hurt himself much more. That's the point of the whole story. Hashem does not want to hurt any of us. He loves all of us. We just simply need to understand that life is not a walk in the park. It's not so simple. We have a mission in the world. Be a light to the nations. 
you, Bo Hashem, are going to a fantastic school. You learn Torah every day. I saw many of you, Bo Hashem, are praying, do the Alel. Do all the, you have all the tools in the world to do good. Sometimes you're going to see the other side, and it looks like the other side, people that are not keeping Torah and Mitzvot, is having more fun. It looks like the other side, maybe they have a better life. You're not alone when you think that. Even the Navi Asaf, the Navi Asaf in Tehilim number 73, says he thought the same thing. He saw some wicked people that were doing all types of things against Hashem, but he saw that they were living the life of luxury. And he says it gave him a little doubt. It made him weaker for a second. He says, Hashem, I saw all these, weak, you know, these people that are going against you, and I don't understand. But then I started realizing, wait a minute. What happens at the end? Okay, so this life, he has a Ferrari. He has a fancy schmancy house. He eats a whole cow every day. Where the he eats everything he wants. He does everything he wants. He has everything he wants. But in reality, what happens in the end? After this life, that 70, 80 years, however long it is, what happens then? Then you have heaven or hell. There's only two choices. There's no third option. If you do good, Hashem says, heaven forever. If not, there's only one other option. So obviously, Asaf said, wait a minute, it looks good now sometimes. But in reality, if you think about the end of what happens after this corridor of a life, you realize it's not worth it. Why? You enjoy yourself for a little bit, and then uh, eventually, time runs out. Now, because Hashem loves us, He doesn't want us to wait till the end. So He'll give us signs like He gave me. And sometimes those signs of sickness, money loss, and all types of other problems. Trust me when I tell you, when you have problems, it's simply Hashem showing you affection, showing you He loves you, showing you that He wants you to get even closer to Him. Because if He didn't care, He'd give you no problems. You just live your life, do whatever you want, and we'll meet at the end. Hashem loves you too much to do it. This is why, Rabotai Karim, we decided that Am Yisrael, doesn't need more business people. I can go back to Wall Street, go back to making millions of dollars. But Amisa doesn't need more business people. We have plenty. Amisa needs stronger Jews. And that's our mission today. Our mission is to give each and every Jew a little chizuk. Doesn't matter what your past is. Doesn't matter where you are today. Our goal is to, Bezad Hashem, give each person a little chizuk. I brought you a bunch of CDs in the back. It's all free. There's uh, four different CDs. Each package has two. Shurim similar to this, different topics. All types of topics, short shurim, long shurim. Also, there is a uh, Asher Yetzar posters, like I said before. You could, if anybody uses the internet, you can watch this on the internet. You can watch all of these shurim on the internet. If you don't, good for you. Just listen to them on CDs. Point being is that the key to constantly getting closer to Hashem is to constantly learn more and more of what He wants from us. Not just the prayer, but the meaning of the prayer. Not just the parasha, but the meaning of the parasha. Not just be robots. If Hashem wanted robots, He'd make robots. But try to go deeper. Deeper into everything. And I promise you, your life is going to be the life that's admirable by everybody else around you. And Bezat Hashem, admirable for all of the nations around us. And Bezat Hashem, also being, uh, making Hashem proud of us for what He made. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Anybody have any questions? I know you guys have classes now, but I didn't know how, what my time was. I just uh, tried to do the uh, best I can. Do you have any questions? You want to have to do? We want to thank Rabbi Yaron Ruben. If you look up online, you could also find Shurim if you want to show them to your parents as well, some of them. Um, if anybody ha does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? Yeah, Chavot. How many kids Three, Baruch Hashem. I have uh, Sarah that's turning four on Shavuot. I have uh, little Ovadia who's a little over two years old. And I have Yosef that's a couple of months old. Baruch Hashem. Yeah, yeah. Three little cuties. Yes. Right. So, the number one thing I was talking to somebody that was very important to me last night. 
And I've been trying to get this person to do tshuva for a while. But if you tell somebody that's not keeping mitzvot to start keeping mitzvot, they're going to tell you why. Why should I do it? Like for what? What is, is it a hocus pocus? If I start keeping Shabbat, all of a sudden my life is going to become heaven? They don't understand. So the most important thing in Judaism is to learn Torah. So my, my number one advice is that if this person is a, somebody that's really important to you, somebody that's really close to you, if it's a parent or a brother or a cousin, somebody that you have a really, really close relationship with, don't teach them yourself. Why? Because they're not going to take the message from you. Because once you're too close to somebody, they're not going to be able to see it from you. They're, they're, it's a little bit of gava, a little bit of pride, a little ego. So what do you do? You send them a, a video clip. You give them a CD. Give them the Torah in a simple way. Give them a CD, give them a short video. We have, Baruch Hashem, hundreds and hundreds of lectures online and uh, probably about five, six hundred short clips that you could take any one of those short clips and send it to them on text messages or something like that. That way they could see it for themselves. Every day, send them another clip. Whether they watch or they don't watch, don't worry about that. Don't do any type of accounting. Oh, this is a strong clip. This is a weak clip. Don't do anything. Just send it. Be almost like a robot. Take a short clip and send it to the people that you care about. Because that way, they're going to learn Torah, but not from you. From somebody else. So that way they figure that if they like it and they want to do something about it, it's almost like they discovered it themselves. Even though you really were the, the mailman. Now, the key is that if you give a person Torah, you give them actual education, you're going to give them a reason behind everything. A reason behind his problems, a reason behind the solution, a, a, you know, a reason for life. And that's what most people don't have. They don't have a real reason for why they're alive. You know, people think that you're here, you make money, you live, you eat, you drink, you have kids, you get married. And today, 80% of people get divorced, unfortunately. I mean, it's, uh, people just live like animals. Torah says, you don't have to live that way. You have an instruction book from God that gives you a wonderful life. You just got to follow it. The better you follow it, the better your life is. And most people don't know that. So if you tell them, listen, here's a book, 304,805 letters. And you say, what are you out of your mind? This is too much. Tell them, okay, why don't you take a smaller book? Uh, you know, 100,000. No, that's too much. Okay, why don't you take a three-hour shoe? No, that's too much. A two hour, too much. Five minute lecture? Okay, I can do that. That's what you do. Take our short clips, five, ten minutes, and send it to them. Once they start liking those five, ten minute clips, send them the full lecture. That's two hours sometimes, or even longer. Then they'll watch it on their own whenever they want. The more education you provide them, the easier it's going to become for them to want to do the mitzvot and not be robots. There are many robots. The do mitzvot because their parents tell them, do mitzvot because they were born that way. Similar to sometimes you have people that literally don't know why they're even doing what they're doing. It's very important for a Bat Israel and a Ben Israel to know why you're doing the mitzvot. Because eventually your brain develops and you want to know what's the purpose of all of it. I met a kid that went to yeshiva for 15 years. And the reason why I met him wasn't on good news. His father came to me and said, please, I want you to meet my child. He's uh, 27, 28 years old, and he's uh, planning on marrying a non-Jew. I said, but did you send him to a good school? He says, I sent him to the best school. I said, yeshiva? Not to, yes, I said he went to yeshiva 15 years. He says, so what happened? He, so I said, you have to meet him. So I meet the kid, and I ask him, what happened? How, how did you go to yeshiva for 15 years, and now you're going with a non-Jew? How could that be? He says, listen, all I learned is that you have to do stuff. I said, okay, you know why, no? He goes, no, I don't know why. So sometimes we do things without searching deep enough to know why. It's very, very important to know why. Because if you know why, you'll be stronger for it. And over time, you'll be able to get other people to become stronger. So these short videos, what we try to do constantly is give a person a reason why we, every mitzvah has a mitzvah. And really, at the end of the day, the reason why we do everything is because Hashem said so. But that's not enough of an explanation for most people. They need more details. So those short videos help a lot. And I think that's the most effective way. Because once they see that the Torah is relevant to their day-to-day -day life, they can apply it to business, they can apply it to marriage, they can apply it to education, to everything else then they'll know that this is where the cure is. And that's how you help them. Next question. 
Anybody? Same price. Yes. I repeat that again. I can't hear you. Yes, Bezat Hashem. Yes. Yes, everything that we do, we try to video because uh, there's a benefit to the public. So we try to reach as many people as possible. And sometimes your questions or the things that I said to you can help somebody in the middle of the world somewhere. So we try to put everything online, usually within about a day or two. And Baruch Hashem, it reaches thousands of people. Yes. Where do they find it? Okay, so we have a website called bezatashem.org. I have a bunch of uh, business cards here. Uh, that on the back of it, if anybody here has uh, uh, smartphones or you have a way to go to the internet, we have an app. We have an app, and uh, all you got to do is uh, take a picture of this thing, and it'll give you, get you to the app. There's a Bezat Hashem app, so it's a kosher app, so you don't have to worry about all the uh, garbage that's on the internet. Uh, you don't have to go to YouTube. You just go, all of our lectures are on this app. Now, if you don't want to have an ability to go on the app, it's on both on Google and on, uh, on Android and also on the uh, iPhone. But you are on YouTube, you just type my name, Yaron Uven. My name is on here, it's on the CDs. And you'll have a whole channel literally full of thousands of uh, lectures on YouTube. We have some on Torah anytime. We have on our own website, Bezat Hashem. So, Baruch Hashem, if you just type my name anywhere, you'll find many, many lectures. And uh, this one will be on there hopefully within the next few days. Thank you so much. Hashem, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for the Rabbanit and with other Shem, we'll keep learning. Anybody that needs anything, it's all over here. It's a, uh, you have questions, you can always, uh, we have WhatsApp groups also. You can ask questions on the WhatsApp groups. Uh, there's, uh, very accessible. I'm trying to do everything possible to become very, very accessible. So have this, uh, the CDs in the back and the uh, cards. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Usually it can go on for a couple of hours, but I know we're, uh, you have a schedule, you have the test, you have everything. So it's, thank you. The screen is good. You have precious Neshamot under your control here, so it's not the same. Also, they just came back from a four day trip. So they're already like uplifted, you know? So, Zayam Amash. Oh, Hashem. Oh, Hashem. Hold the bell, Beito. So there's different specific, there's different subjects to learn to understand what's uh, you know you like the Torah but you want to like the mashmau the meaning behind it the significance behind it. We have a series called the Bitachon series. Uh, that series is very good because it shows you how, like, the learning you can apply to your day-to-day -day life and connect to Hashem on a deeper level. We just started, to maybe like 10 lectures in. Uh, so there's different things you can learn like that that's going to help you. Um, I think that the more uh, you try to connect the mitzvot that you do to Hashem, the easier it's going to become. But in the beginning, you have to, uh, it takes a little work. It takes a little more learning about the mitzvot, like what's the meaning behind the mitzvah. Uh, so I think the Bitachon series will help you with that, and also the Musar series. We have a couple of CDs in the back. That's also going to help. Uh, but in general, it's, it's asking questions. Asking questions like, why do we do this? What's the point of this? Like, every, everything that you have a question in, that uh, you have a difficulty about, ask. Ask a question. Find the answer. And if, let's say, the teacher doesn't have it, then try to find somewhere else that has it. Because sometimes we'll ask a question, and if we don't get the answer, it creates what's called a safik, like a doubt. And that doubt is like, oh, okay, so I don't know. Okay, so no big deal. No, it is a big deal. You have to try harder to get that answer because the harder you work on finding an answer to something, the more meaning it's going to have. And when you finally get that meaning, that meaning is going to help you connect to Hashem. Because now you know, oh, everything has an answer. I just have to find this. I have to find it. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's right. You open a book, it's there. It's black or white. 
Sometimes you have to work on it. You have to open a few books or you have to have several rabbis because not all rabbis have the same knowledge. Some rabbis are experts, let's say, in uh, alakha. Some rabbis are experts in musal. Some rabbis are experts in something else. You know, so you have to ask the right, right rabbi, just like somebody you have to go to the right doctor. So always, always make, make it like a policy in your life to always go after the answer. Like work hard to get the answer, the, the questions that you have answered. So if the first place that you go to doesn't have the answer, go to another place, go to another rabbi and try to get these answers because those, those answers are going to help you eliminate any doubt that you have and it's going to help you also connect to Hashem. And what if I ask questions? Like, like let's say you ask, I ask questions like that, he says something and then I ask them like a teacher and then they say something else. Right. So the, the most important thing is to make sure that whoever gives you the answer, it's not their answer, it's the Torah's answer. Meaning, they give you an answer with a source. Okay, thank you. You ask him, what is such and such? And he says, it's this. Okay, where did you get that answer from? Like, where did he get that answer from? And he has to tell you, oh, I got it from the Gemara. Okay, where is in the Gemara? And you have to look at you. Now you have a source, because, you know, if it says in the Gemara, that's it. That's, that's from Hashem. But if it's just his opinion, then uh, that, that's not worth anything. So that's why whoever gives you an answer, if it's your father or if it's your teacher or if it's some local rabbi, whoever it is, always ask for a source. Because if there's a source for it, then you know this is valid. If there's no source, then it's 50-50. Maybe it is valid, maybe it's his opinion, maybe uh, you have to have a source. That's why it's a very, very important to have sources. It has to have a book with a name and a page number and exactly where this answer is. Because if you have that, then you know, okay, this is the word of Hashem. If you don't have it, then sometimes it's not. A lot of people say things because it makes sense to them, but it's wrong. So always make sure that there's a source. Whoever gives you the answer, doesn't matter who gives you the answer. So you have to have a source, and it's, it's a good policy. That's what the Mishnah Navot says, that any time you say a Divrei Torah, you have to make sure that you mention the source, because that way we know that we can track that answer all the way to Mount Sinai. You know, we know, that, okay, he got it from his rabbi, his rabbi got it from that rabbi, that rabbi got it from that rabbi, and all the way to Mount Sinai. But if you don't say the source, then we don't really know where it came from. We don't know if it's your opinion, or it's his opinion, or it's somebody that some non-Jew made, or we have no idea what it is. We have no, you know, there's a website right now that started publishing commentary, and they didn't even know that uh, uh, the, uh, the people, at least the people that were viewing it, didn't even know that some of this commentary is coming from Christianity. That's a Jewish website, but they're providing commentary from Christians. So they're, they're, it's, it's like Machtiya Rabim. It's like you're, you're causing people to sin because the commentary is a, is, a, is a wrong source. It's not a good place. It's a place of Tumah. So that's, it's very important to know who the source is. And when you have the source, then you'll have a lot of confidence behind what it says. You know, and, uh, and anything you have as far as questions, you could always ask, send a text message. Uh, WhatsApp is usually the fastest. Any question you have, send it to us. We'll try to answer. Yes. Now that you do, like, um, if you do something bad, or you sin, you do shuvah to make up for But when you do it, you create a bad angel. Okay. But when you do tshuva, do you destroy it? If it's, if it's a real tshuva, if it's a full tshuva, then yes. So, it isn't like, let's say, you go to tshuva, it doesn't stay there? If you did full tshuva, and then you actually can even get to a point of turning the bad angel into a good one. If it's full tshuva. But if it's like half a tshuva, then the angel stays. Depends. How about if you're like, you did something wrong and you realize what you did wrong? And realizing, did you create a good angel? By realize, just by thought, no. No, by action. You have to take action. So, for example, if somebody stole and they realize, oh, it's wrong to steal. Realizing it's wrong to steal is not enough. You have to return the money. You know, once you return the money, then you've completed your chuba uh, as far as the first stage because you felt, you saw that it's wrong. You gave the money back and now you have to get to a point of regretting it and committing to never do it again. And at that point... You, Hashem could put a stamp, oh, this person did full tshuva, you destroyed that, uh, the bad angel, and you actually even turned him into a good one. So the full tshuva is, number one, stop the sin, don't do it anymore. Uh, second thing is, if you could undo it, meaning if it's money stolen or something like that, or if it's, you said something bad about somebody, you uh, come back to that person and you say, you apologize to them and tell all the people that you said something bad about them, uh, that uh, it was your mistake, you didn't, you know, this is what you did, and it's wrong, and so on and so forth. So anyone that knows this information, you tell them that this is really wrong. 
Um, so you undo as much of the damage as you possibly can. Uh, that's the second thing. Third is regret it to the point of feeling bad about it, to commit to never doing it again. Never doing it again. And then try to encourage other people to also not make that sin. So if let's say, for example, somebody comes to you and says, Lashonara uh, about somebody else, don't just do nothing. Tell you, you know what, actually I heard if you say Lashonara, try to give her a little bit of Musar, a little bit of review, tell her it's not good to do. Because then it's going to create problems, she's going to be embarrassed, he's going to be embarrassed because of this. Let's just not do it. And try to encourage other people to not sin. When you encourage other people to not sin, that is the ultimate step of doing Shubha. So if I saw somebody and I spoke Lashonara about you, like, do I have to tell him specifically what I said? Okay. So, you know, if I say, like, like, I made fun of you, like, I have to tell him exactly what I said? No, it doesn't have to be, like, every single word, but the general, general, general what you said, yeah. Yes, I do. You go to my channel, Yaron Oven, and I have about uh, I have about uh, maybe 50 lectures in Hebrew, and also this is a uh, CD in Hebrew for my rabbi, Rabbi Ephraim. Uh, it's in Hebrew, but I also myself have many lectures. This story in Hebrew and many other lectures in Hebrew. Just type my name, the same YouTube channel or the same website. Just type my name in Hebrew, and you'll see many lectures in Hebrew. Um, also, my mom, she has like, sisters and brothers from Israel, but like. She only, she's only keeping Shabbat. She's like the only one who, and like I tell her like, can you like do something to help them? She says she doesn't know what to do because like they don't listen to her. They what? take stuff home, take what? stuff with them. So what she could do is she can give them some of these CDs or send them some of the like, lectures that I have, and share the information with them without telling them directly what to do. She'll just share the information with them, and uh, <laughs> little by little people will start watching. And little by little people will start doing. Most people are not sinning. Uh, because they hate Hashem. They sin because they simply don't know the consequence, they don't know what to do, they don't know what not to do, they don't really know what's going on. So if you educate them, you give them the information, then they have the ability to make a real decision because now they have both sides. So the best thing to do is to share lectures with them um, and different videos, the CDs, you could take as many as you want extras to give it to people and uh, that way it's the, uh, you're giving them an opportunity to at least learn. And Bezat Hashem, it works. It works with a lot of people. Yes, hi. So, I have an uncle, right? And he's not religious at all. Okay. And he has a non Jew girlfriend. Mm -hmm. We're all telling him, oh, like, if she converts, I mean, it's going to be all fine. Like, he's going to have a Jewish family. But I'm like, we're all afraid that in the end, she's not going to be like. Religious. Yeah, she's going to be acting the same as she was. Right, well, if, if he goes to a real Bedin, they won't convert her unless they're both religious. They both have to do tshuva and be really religious before they allow her to convert. My recommendation is to send him, uh, the, uh, this, give him a copy of this CD. The black, there's two CDs in here, uh, in that little packet. There's one black one, which is, uh, and then there's one blue one. Give him the black one, take an extra copy, give him the black one, and it's the first lecture on there is my full story that's a little longer than what I told you guys today. Have him and her listen to it. Um, or if he watches things online, you could just look up the name of that one on the internet and send him the link to that lecture. So what if they get married without like him, like her consent? Right now, they're technically considered, you know, there's no such thing as marriage without con with, uh, with Jews and non-Jews. I mean, they could get married through the city, but as far as no rabbi, no real rabbi will marry them. There's no chupa and kiddushin. So right now... Whether he gets married to the city or he doesn't get married to the city, it's still a huge sin in Shemaim. It's the same thing. Nothing changes. Um, the problem is that the longer he's with her, the more he could create more damage because eventually they could have kids. And those kids will be non-Jewish. So that means that you know, even if she does convert, there's still a problem. There's still the kid that's not Jewish. Maybe the kid wants to convert. Maybe he doesn't want to convert. The point is the longer it lasts, the more problems he creates for himself. Uh, the only way to uh, the only way to get him to realize his mistake is by educating him, not by telling him you should get her converted. You have to tell him why. And usually the people 
don't understand why by telling them nice stories. You have to tell them what's going to happen in a bad way. You have to warn them. And my story, Baruch Hashem, has helped thousands and thousands of people because they see that bad stuff can happen here. It's not just like uh, this genom that uh, people don't know what it is. It's, there's actually bad stuff that can happen in this world. And um, this uh, lecture has helped thousands of people because they realize that, yeah, uh, this could happen to me. This could happen to everybody. So I think you should give him that CD. You can give it to him directly. You can give it to him anonymous. Just leave it in his, uh, in his mailbox if you feel uncomfortable. No problem. Just leave it there in his mailbox and hopefully pray for, for him to watch it. And Bazal Hashem, it works. Thank you so much. Right. How do you make someone feel like he should have, for example, like eat bad or anything to or like best thing is same thing I was telling her is to give people these CDs give them uh, the uh, lectures to watch and give them a, you know education about it meaning you have to they have to understand not only why they should do it because it's good but why it's bad not to do it meaning that there has to be a punishment like for example if uh, somebody's on the highway and they want to drive 100 miles an hour now, most of the time, they don't. Why? Because they're afraid that if they drive 100 miles an hour, they're going to get a ticket, and they're going to lose their license. So knowing that there's a risk, there's a risk to, to, taking, to, to, to driving really fast, they don't do it. Same thing here. What I teach in my lectures is basic stuff that explains to people that if you don't do what Hashem do- says, there's a risk. But it's not a small risk. It's a big one. It's a really big one. And for people that are advanced, I even have a whole shiur about genom. It's not a good place. It's as horrible as it gets, and all the horrible that people could imagine, it's even worse than that. So the point is that when people watch that shiul, they realize, oh, wow, Hashem's not joking around. Like, there's, there's, there's a, it's, he's, he's not our friend, he's our God. So most people don't understand, oh, listen, you know, if you keep Shabbat, maybe Hashem's going to give you money, or maybe he's going to give you good health. They don't understand that stuff. They say, listen, I already have money, or I'll just make money another way. So if you tell them, listen, if you don't keep Shabbat, Hashem's going to kill you. Hashem is going to punish you because so he says in the Torah. Then the person may get, uh, you know, uh, you'll get his attention. But if you just say it like that, it's not enough. So that's what we do in the whole shiul. We give them examples of what it says in the Torah, different things, and oh, Hashem, it works. And what if it doesn't want, like, what if he doesn't want to, like, watch it? If he doesn't want to watch it, then it becomes almost impossible to help him because a person needs to want to help himself. He needs to want to help himself. So what I suggest with most people is to send them short clips. I have a, on the uh, YouTube, uh, there's one playlist that has a, uh, like short movies. Short movies, like lectures, but it's like five, ten minutes, but it's as a movie. Like it has all special effects and stuff like that. And everybody loves it, whether they're religious, not religious, everybody loves that stuff. Usually those things are a good uh, bait to get people to start watching some of the other lectures. So if you want, you could send me a, text me a message and I'll send you that playlist and you could send them one of those. Uh, and that's uh, usually the, the best way to get people started. And we pray. Okay. Yes, Nick? Okay, so, Ken. Um, if you want to take a um, get rid of like bad things and you, you're trying to figure it out but you have like something is holding you back. Ken. How do you um, get out of it? It depends what the habit is, and it depends what's holding you back. If what's holding you back is peer pressure, for example, uh, somebody that, uh, let's say, doesn't want to say Lashon Ara anymore, but our friends like to say Lashon Ara, then she has to start thinking, okay, what am I really getting out of this? She starts have, she just has to do the Cheshbon, Cheshbon Nefesh. We have to do start accounting. What am I really getting out of this, Lashon Ara? The person that I'm saying Lashon Ara about is taking all of my mitzvot. So all day I work to get mitzvot, I say Lashon Ara about them, they're getting all my mitzvot. So now, so I already lost. Second thing is it's a sin. Third of all, they're gonna get embarrassed. If they embarrass me, I wouldn't feel good. Why would I embarrass somebody else? Fourth of all, which is the worst part, is that, okay, one day I'm gonna have to go up to Shemaim, and Hashem is gonna say, how come you said Lashon Ara about so-and-so? And I'm gonna feel, uh, I'm not gonna have a real explanation. Now, if I'm going to ask my friends to come, oh, please defend me because you're the one that said it, they're not going to be able to defend me. So once you start really going deeper into the, the action, you start realizing it's not worth it. It's the same thing with everything. You have to analyze what's the point of anything that you do in life. Why say Lashon Ara? Why drive on Shabbat? Why eat non-kosher? All these different things, and usually most of these things don't have a point. 
Like there's no real benefit out of it. A big yes after this age is makeup on Shabbat. Ah, makeup. So Hashem says that it's a a soul to to draw on Shabbat, to paint on Shabbat to such an extent that it's a person that violates Shabbat. He is judged as if he's an idol worshiper. Like somebody that prays to Buddha and somebody that drives on Shabbat or paints on Shabbat, same thing. And that's not a good look. That's not a good thing. In Shemaim, you go to Shemaim and say, no, I pray to you every Shem. She goes, no, no. You Buddha statue section, not a Shem section. Why? Because you're uh, drawing on Shabbat. So we have to understand there's a significance to the sin. It's not, we may not think it's a big deal because we don't know all the details, but Hashem knows for sure it's a big deal. Now, once a person realizes that the uh, alachot that we have in the Torah have a consequence if we don't follow them. Like, you have to know that if you follow it, good. If you don't follow it, there is a serious consequence. That's why we have 13 principles of fate, and one of them is reward and punishment. All Jews have to believe this. Everything has a reward or a punishment. It's not nothing. Nothing has nothing. Like, it's either this or it's this. There's nothing neutral. So either you get rewarded for something or you get punished for something. Sometimes you get punished here. Sometimes you get punished there. Sometimes you get punished in both. Sometimes you get rewarded here. Sometimes over there. Sometimes both. But the point is, it has to be one of them. So if a person is going to do something that Hashem says it's not allowed. It's not even the rabbi says it's not allowed. Hashem says it's not allowed. So that means, it doesn't mean reward. It means punishment. Now, is it really worth it to get punished for... What, to put a little bit of uh, lip liner or gloss or something so, uh, you know, somebody looks and says, oh, wow, she looks better. The reality is, I'm telling you as a guy, most guys don't even notice this stuff. Most guys don't even care. And that's the reality. Second of all, the people that care are usually other girls, and you're not marrying another girl, so that doesn't matter anyway. Uh, and uh, most importantly, at the end of the day, the only one that's going to be able to help you when you're down, when you're depressed, when you're alone, when a person is sick, when a person needs something, when a person wants something, the only one that's going to help you in the world is Hashem. So how are we justifying that Hashem is going to help us if we're constantly doing things that are against Him? So always think, what does Hashem want for me? If He wants this, if I do what He wants on a regular basis, then when I ask for something or I need something, then He has a reason to give it to me. But if I'm constantly going against them because I'm trying to impress my friends, then my friends can't help me. And Hashem, I, I gave him a reason not to help me. Why? Because I'm doing things that are against them. So you have to, you know, just do the accounting. Is it really worth it? A lot of the stuff is not worth it, especially the big things. Make sure you know, there's a few really big mitzvot in the Torah you don't want to mess with. Shabbat is one of them. Shabbat is not, there's no exceptions. There's no like uh, half a Jew. There's no such thing as a half a Jew. There's no such thing as a, as a righteous Jew. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's no such thing as a righteous Jew that violates Shabbat on purpose. If you make a sin by accident, that's a different story. But makeup doesn't look like an accident. You know, makeup is not an accident. If you turn on the light by accident because, uh, you know, you woke up in the middle of the night and you forgot it's Shabbat because it's the middle of the night and you turn on the light, that's shogig. But a person that puts on makeup or uh, watches TV or plays with their phone on Shabbat, that's not an accident. So Shemaim says, this is 100% the same thing. Thank you. This is the same thing as if she was driving on Shabbat. And Hashem says, that's a very serious violation. So you don't want that. You don't want that on your account. Because, Baruch Hashem, you go to a good school. You learn good things. You pray every day. You talk to Hashem. You do all, all good things. Why ruin all of it just for one small thing that, in reality, doesn't really mean that much? So... It's a, uh, you have to learn that there is a, uh, some things are just not worth it. Like a, uh, people that usually like, for example, they, they go on a diet. They go on a diet and, you know, they keep a really, really strict diet. You know, they eat protein, protein, protein for a long time and they lose some weight and they feel better about themselves. But then one day their friend says, do you want to come out for a burger? It's kosher and everything, but it's a, you know, it's a nice juicy fat burger. And they say to themselves, is it really worth it? Now, yes, the burger is delicious. You're going to find it delicious. But the problem is that it's not the burger that's the problem. It's what happens after the burger. I've been working so hard for six months, a year, two years to become healthier. 
But now I'm going to eat this burger. Now, the burger by itself is not a problem. But now it's going to go back into my mind that it's an option. And then maybe I'm going to want it again tomorrow. And then I'm going to want it again tomorrow. And then what happens is after two, three weeks of, uh, of, of doing that, my year work goes in the garbage. So then it's not even worth it. But you're eventually going to have to eat it. No, you, you can, but again, you have a choice. Is it worth I can eat, but I don't necessarily have to eat the burger. I can eat something else, something that's healthier. I don't have to eat the burger. I can eat something healthier. So that's, that's the point. The point is, is that sometimes there are certain things in our life that are just not worth it. If you think about what's the consequence of doing it. It's like, for example, if somebody speeds on a highway because they're in a hurry. It's, yeah, you're in a hurry. You want to get to an appointment on time. But if you hurry too much and you start driving 100 miles an hour, you're putting your life at risk. It's not worth it to put your life at risk just to get to some appointment. You know, so you, you just think about, you know, what's going to happen after? What's the risk? What's the reward? And that's why the Mishnah Navot says, Ezeu chacham, tanulad. Who is wise? Somebody that sees what's born from what can, what's happening. Meaning you see what could happen. What are the two options or five options or ten options of what could happen as an outcome of everything that I do. And once you look at things that way, 90% of the things that are like bad habits get go, in, go in the garbage because you realize it's just not worth it. Most of these bad habits are not worth it. You know, it's, uh, but you have to think about it. You have to, you know, not just act and just start thinking about things more. And you'll be able to question. overcome. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, you said to one of the girls here that um, her, it's like really, really like horrible. But yesterday, one of our teachers told us that it's not like burning or anything. I don't know if that makes sense. It's not? Like burning. Like our, our like, like when you think of hell, you think like red. Right. But um, one of our teachers told us yesterday that it's not, that's not what like hurts, like, that's not what like burns your inside, it's um, apparently like it's a picture, so it could have looked. Um, every time you ask a question and somebody gives you an answer, you always have to make sure that the answer has a source, has a source, because if I just say an answer, that answer is 50-50. Why? It may be right, it may be wrong. But if it has a source in a Torah book, meaning in a Gemara, in a Mishnah, in a Sifre Tzadikim, somewhere, then I know it's not my opinion. I know it's, that's Torah's opinion. So sometimes people don't know something, and they say something that makes sense to them. Or they say something that they hope makes sense to you, but they don't really know. A lot of people don't know about that topic. It's not a very common topic for people to study. Um, because of the life that I lived um, and because of what I do, I spent a lot of time studying the topic. And I can tell you for sure that it's not an imaginary place. It's not, doesn't hurt. It's quite the opposite. I have a whole shiur about it. It's called Genom. Uh, and it's, I don't recommend it for everybody because it's very, very graphic. Uh, not you don't see anything, but just the stuff that the Torah says about it is, is not, you know, not pleasant. Um, and I bring Torah sources from a Tanakh, from a Gemara, from a Zohar, from Sifret Tzadikim, from Hasidut, all over the Torah. We, we, I think we went over 1,400 sources in the Torah. A lot of sources. It's not like it's like one person's opinion and then everybody else contradicts him. This is a widely known opinion. And the problem is in our generation, most people do not know anything about this topic. And they just decide that, uh, you know, Geinom doesn't exist. Hell doesn't exist. Or it's just a place that uh, maybe uh, you're confused a little bit. And they make it like it's uh, some laundry room and you go there for like a few hours and then everything is okay. That's not what it is. Geinom is a very real place. There's entire books written about it. There's sections and so on and so forth. A person needs to know this at some point in their life. Usually, uh, Rav Avadya said you should start teaching your kid that it exists at six years old. Details, maybe later on, maybe around your age, a little older. Point being is that a person needs to know that it exists at least once in their life because now you know that all of the sins are not worth it, for sure. Why? Because you don't even want a 1% chance of going to this place. You want to do everything possible to avoid this place under all costs. And when somebody tells you that it doesn't exist, 
The only response you should give them is, can you give me a source from the Torah that says what you said? Show me a book that says it doesn't exist. Or it's uh, a place that people, are, whatever, whatever it is that they said, can I see it in a book? Can I see somebody that's a big rabbi? It could be the Lubavitcher Rebbe, it could be uh, Rabbi Vadia, it could be uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva, it could be anybody. He wrote it, he put a, his, his signature on the book, that, this is what it says. Can you show me? Nobody could show you that, because it doesn't exist. Anybody that says those things doesn't have a source. They either don't know, or they're scared to tell you the truth. Most of the time, they don't know. And that's because it's not a comfortable topic to study. When I studied it the first time, I wasn't comfortable. The second time I studied it, I started crying. That's how bad it is. It's not fun. It's, 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 the more you understand what happens if a person does not go in the, in the way of Hashem, the, the, the more difficult it is. It's important to know that Hashem has reward and punishment. He does not want anybody to go there. But it's available. Why? Because that's how he runs the world. If everybody went to heaven, then why should we keep Torah? If everybody goes to the same place as Moshe Rabbeinu, what's the point then? You know, why, why, why should we keep mitzvot? Why shouldn't we just all like, you know, run around and do, uh, start eating pork in the middle of the street? Like, why do anything if everybody goes to heaven? Everybody's been best friends with Moshe Rabbeinu. So obviously Hashem says, yes, there's a place of heaven, there's a place that's hell. Or Genom, or whatever you want to call it. There's uh, seven names. There's different, different places. You want to go here? That's the options of how to get here. You want to go here? That's the options of how to get here. And a person knows that that's a motivator of how we live our life here. People that are scared of learning about scary topics are, uh, don't understand that that's the motivation for a human being in general. Like, you don't drive fast on a highway, not because you don't want to drive fast. It's because you don't drive because you don't want to get into an accident, you don't want to get a ticket, you don't want to put other people at risk. There's, you're scared of stuff. You don't, you know, people work not because they like to work. They work because they don't want to be poor, they don't want to starve, they don't want to depend on other people. You know, you're scared that bad things are going to happen to you. That's why you do stuff in everything in life. Everything that we do in life is motivated by fear. That's human nature. That's how we operate our life. You study for a test. Why? Because you don't want to fail. You're scared of failing. Because if you fail, you're not going to move up to the next grade. So fear is a good thing. That's what motivates human beings. Hashem says, yes, you should be afraid of not only things in this world, but also things that happen after this world. Not because I want you to go there, chas v'shalom, but because you need to know it exists. And if you don't do good, that's the only option. But if everybody got good, if everybody went to the same heaven, then what's the point? Why do we even have to keep any mitzvot? You can't tell me that it's more fun. Because sometimes when a, when a person starts doing tshuva like I did, in the beginning it wasn't fun. After you do it for a while, it's amazing. You get to know the meaning of it, the purpose of life, and it's, uh, you know, you live a life of Kedusha, it's amazing. But in the beginning, not only is it not fun, it's hard. All of a sudden, you can't work on Shabbat. All of a sudden, you have to eat specific type of food. All of a sudden, you can't uh, look at anything that you want. All of a sudden, everything changes. It's, tough, it's difficult. So, if there's no reward and punishment, then what's the point? If I'm going to go to heaven anyway, why should I keep any Torah? Then why does it say, say in the Torah that, uh, you know, Korach, the earth opened and swallowed him and he's still there suffering till this day. So what? He's the only one in the world that ever got punished? It's not fair. And what? Everybody else, the Hitler and uh, all the other people that were wicked, they don't get punished? Only Korah got punished? So obviously we see that it's mentioned in the Torah many, many times. It's just that most people never study the subject so they don't really know what to answer. And sometimes people, uh, you know, they're uncomfortable not giving you an answer so they just make up an answer. And that's uh, not good, but it happens. But in general, if you look at the Torah sources, you'll see that there are thousands of sources about it. It's, a, uh, it's one of the 13 principles of faith. Rambam writes 13 principles of faith. Reward and punishment. Reward and punishment does not mean this world. It means the next world. So there's no like bad heaven. There's only a good heaven. Which means that the bad happens somewhere else. Name it whatever you want. That's not heaven though. So that's the thing. So it's a, uh, if a person knows that this exists, he already knows it's not worth it to sin. It's not worth it to go against the Shem. And uh, he's going to try harder. She's going to try harder to do good. And sometimes you fall. It happens. In Sadiq Shaloyichta, every, everybody sins once in a while. But at least they're not going to do it on purpose. At least they're not going to continue with it. They're going to do tshuva. They're going to get better. 
and little by little uh, stop sinning. But at least they know that there's a consequence, just like in life, regular life. We just have to end it.